This video is going to give you some important background science for when we study the atomic model of matter uh, and tell the story of that model. When you're finished with this video, you should be able to describe the science of constant proportions, cathode rays, alpha particles, and waves, light, and energy. That's the background science you're going to need to know to understand the atomic model of matter story. Let's get on with it. We're open for business. All right, first background concept is that substances combine in constant proportions. Now, you can imagine, uh, probably most of you have made at some point in your life a drink called Kool-Aid. You mix some water with some Kool-Aid and you Kool-Aid powder and you get uh, the substance Kool-Aid. Uh, it's really a mixture of, of, of water and of that powder. In fact, uh, if you were to let the water just sit there, uh, for a long period of time, you'd find that the what would be left behind would be some Kool-Aid powder and the water would go off into the air. So when you make Kool-Aid, you're not really making a new substance. There's, it's still a mixture of these things. There's still powder in there and there's still water in there. And they just come right back apart again if you let it evaporate. You've probably seen this sort of thing uh, when uh, in the road in the winter, uh, you've got some kind of a, uh, some salt that dissolves in the water when the truck puts the salt down. And then when that evaporates, you get a little patch of salt left behind on the road, and the water has gone off into the air. So in that mixture, salt water, you still have the salt and the water. They're mixed together. It's not a new substance. It's still two substances. Okay. So scientists... Uh, wondered, well, so let me go back to the Kool-Aid for a second. So you can make uh, weak Kool-Aid if you had a low proportion of this to this, or a strong Kool-Aid if you had a high proportion of this to this. So basically you can make Kool-Aid in any proportion. There isn't a constant proportion that you need to make Kool-Aid with. And scientists in the late 1700s wondered if other substances were more like Kool-Aid in that way, or were they not? Uh, a common substance that they could substances they could combine uh, is the, were the substances of hydrogen and oxygen. Turns out that if you react, not just mix, but actually react uh, hydrogen and oxygen together, the word react implies that you form a brand new substance called water, uh, which is in some ways not really a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, but a brand new substance itself. Well, anyway, scientists wondered if we did this, could we react them in just any old proportion or not? So here are some data, uh, sample data that, that could have been derived at from, from, the, from any scientist doing this. So what if you react 16 grams of oxygen and 2 grams of hydrogen? Well, what you get, even though these are both gases, is you get 18 grams of water. All right? That seemed to react in a 16 to 2 ratio or a proportion. But what happened if you act 32 grams and 2 grams? Well, there were lots of scientists that thought, well, hey, you're going to get 34 grams of water. But you know what? When you do this experiment, that's not what you get. What you get is 18 grams of water, plus you get 16 grams of oxygen left over. You see, because then you're reacting 16 grams of oxygen and 2 grams of hydrogen in that 16 to 2 ratio. So it was looking like, in fact, when you make new substances, not in a mixture like the Kool-Aid, but a brand new substance like water, the components of that can't put, be put together in just any old proportion, but in a constant proportion, in the case of water, 16 to 2. Now, if you're understanding this, you're going to be able to predict, what if we react 16 grams of oxygen and 4 grams of hydrogen? Did you predict that we would get 18 grams of water plus some leftover hydrogen, plus 2 grams of leftover hydrogen? Because then we, can re then we will still be reacting 16 grams of oxygen to 2 grams of, of hydrogen to get the water. Let's give you one more. What if 32 grams of oxygen react with 4 grams of hydrogen? 
did you say that you'd get 36 grams of water? Well, you would because all of this will react with all of this because that is 32 to 4 is the same as 16 to 2. So you'll get 16 grams and 2 grams and another 16 grams and 2 grams, 36 grams total of water. That's the idea of constant proportions. And it happens when scientists found it happens when you're making new substances. So what do we need to know about constant proportions? What we need to know is that when mixing things where they don't really become a new substance, you get can mix them in any proportion. But if you're making a brand new substance, things come together in constant proportions. And we'll see how scientists use that in their discovery of the atom. Let's go on to the next concept. The next concept is the concept of cathode rays. Uh, in the mid-1800s, people, engineers, and scientists had figured out how to make a tube of glass and take all the air out of it. They used something called a vacuum pump, and they could kind of suck all the air out of the, out of the glass tube. And they were interested in that because they were interested in what would it be like to try to pass electricity through um, air or even less than air if you take most of the air out. And so they built this kind of tube here, which at the time was called a Crookes tube, uh, where you had two things and they would connect up to those two things. They were called the cathode and the anode. They connect up a, a, what was like a battery. Not exactly a battery, but it was, it was close enough to a battery. Uh, and one side was called the cathode and the other part was called the anode. And they were hoping to get electricity to move through like that. What happened when they actually hooked that up is they got this tube to glow. There's a tube like that that's glowing. And what they found is that the more air that you took out of the tube, the dimmer it gets. Now those kind of tubes are a lot like the tubes that you see in restaurants and stores, the neon signs. This tube is very similar to this tube. So uh, they were able to find that when you reduce the amount of air in here and continually reduce it, the light gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Well, something else happened uh, as they dimmed the lights. They noticed that, you know, sort of once the glow got to be not too great, they noticed that um, this side of the end of the tube started to glow, like the glass itself was glowing. And they found a way they could make that even more visible by painting kind of like a, what would be almost like a fluorescent material. And that would glow extremely well, uh, even with all of the air taken out. Uh, and, and that was kind of interesting. So then they did something like they put in here, they put some kind of a, a shape. And what they noticed was a shadow formed over here. Let me show you a picture of that. Here's another Crookes tube. Here's the cathode down here. I don't know, and this is the anode down here. I don't know if you can see it, but there's like a plus shape or cross here. And there's a shadow formed on this uh, fluorescent material back here. And that was kind of the first clue that to scientists that when they hooked up this battery, that there wasn't just some sort of electricity, I don't know what it is sort of thing going on, that there was actually some sort of uh, some sort of something traveling down this way and it would get sometimes blocked and other times it would get through and when it got blocked then it would leave a shadow there. Um, and they had no idea what these things were but they the conclusion from the shadow was that whatever it, whatever it was wasn't just sort of all over the place, it was definitely shooting from here over to here. And because they didn't know what they were, uh, they called them cathode rays because they came from the cathode. Uh, and this was uh, an interesting discovery that merited further uh, looking into. And we'll see some of the scientists we study will look into cathode rays and try to deduce a bunch more about them.
but in the late 1800s, all that was known was how to make them and give them a name, but no idea much more about their nature than that. So what we need to know about cathode rays is that they are formed when you run electricity in this tube, Crookes tube, uh, and that they seem to be something. Uh, in other words, it isn't just sort of randomly glowing. There definitely seems to be something moving there. That's kind of what we need to know about cathode rays, is that they come from the cathode, and they are definitely something moving down that way toward and past the anode. Let's look at our next concept. Our next concept, background concept number three, is alpha particles. Now again, a lot of this work happened in the 1800s, uh, and one one interesting thing that was discovered in the 1800s was that there were some rocks that would expose a piece of photographic film. Now, photographic film is kind of old-fashioned in this day and age of digital cameras, but it used to be that you'd use film instead of a digital camera to take a picture, and the light would hit the film, and it would change the film a little bit in a way that would make a picture. Well, it turns out if you take some kinds of rocks that even if you put the film in a dark, completely dark cabinet, it would become exposed or changed. And it happened because these rocks were nearby. And scientists at the time deduced that these rocks were giving off something that was exposing the, the, uh, the film. Now, uh, there were a bunch of different kind of rocks that did that, and among other things, scientists deduced or named the thing that they were giving these rocks were giving off. They named them alpha particles. They didn't really have any idea what they were. They just called them alpha particles because it was a name to give something that they knew it was giving off. But they quickly found uh, that alpha particles uh, had some interesting uses. For example, uh, they could take the rock that give off our alpha particles, they could put it in a box. And then, while some of the alpha particles, let me put it in a box here, some of the alpha particles would zip off this way. They'd fly off in any old direction they wanted to. They didn't seem to care which direction they came out of the rock, but came out they did. But if they put it in a box with a small opening, then they could get whatever alpha particles got out of the box they could get them to shoot out in a straight line. Sort of like making an alpha particle gun. Uh, not really in the same way a gun works, but in the sense that they could get these, these things to shoot out, remembering that they had really absolutely no idea what they were. Uh, but being as they were called alpha particles, let's imagine drawing a little circle there for that, moving that way. Now one experiment they did to investigate alpha particles is they took some charged metal plates and we studied charges the other day in class. And what they found is, if they shot it through these charged metal plates and then had it come against a screen that would fluoresce when the particle hit it, they found that these alpha particles, as they came through the plates, would bend off like that and hit over here as if they were being attracted to the negative and repelled from the positive. This led scientists to believe that these alpha particles whatever they were, or alpha rays, whatever, had a positive charge. Another thing they could deduce is that they were fairly massive. They were about as massive as some, um, uh, you know, s some pieces of other material. So they were a fairly massive particle. Here's how, could, here's how they could tell that. Turns out if it's not very massive, then it's easy for this electric force to shove this thing like this. If it's not very massive, it doesn't have much inertia, it's easy to change its motion from going straight to going curved. But if it's really massive, then it's hard and it won't curve much. So by the amount of curvature, by the curvature, they could tell the mass. And so they knew this was a fairly massive particle. Actually, they could just tell that it was massive, and they could tell it was positive. So they, so those are the two things that they knew about them. 
but then they found they're actually a fairly useful tool. Here's a neat kind of experiment that they did. Imagine a billiard table. They put up the cue ball there. All right, now imagine that uh, we shoot the cue ball here and we have some kind of cover and underneath the cover there's some things. Well, what if we shoot the cue ball and we see the cue ball coming out like that? Well, then we can imagine maybe there was something in there that made it deflect like that. Or maybe the cue ball comes straight out. Or maybe the cue ball comes in like this and we see another ball come shooting out that way and the cue ball comes shooting out that way. Well, these are the kind of experiments they did with alpha particles. They would shoot them into some unknown thing and they'd see what would happen. What would pop out? Would new things pop out? Would the alpha particle get deflected? So they were using the alpha particle sort of like a probe. Let me get this stuff out of here. I'll show you that a little bit more. All right, so they put some kind of substance here, a sample of some kind of substance, usually pretty thin, and they'd shoot the alpha particle at it. And again, they'd see what would happen. Would the alpha particle move like that? Would another particle get shot out? And so they use the alpha particle kind of as a probe. So what are some things that scientists know about, knew about alpha particles and how did they know it? They knew they were positively charged by how they interacted with these plates. They knew they were massive by how much they bent. And they could use them as probes into materials. That's the important things to know about alpha particles. Let's go on to our last background. Our last background concept is the concept of waves and energy. So the important thing to know here is that one, one important thing is to know that when you s take light from, say, a light bulb or the sun, and you send it through a device, this one's called a prism, but there are other devices that do that. You can take that light and you can break it up into colors. Water in the atmosphere does the same thing, with, uh, and that's what makes a rainbow. Now, if we were going to take this, instead of looking at it here, if we were to project it on a wall, what we might see is something like this. Okay. We might see on the wall something like this. It's called the continuous spectra. And uh, scientists knew that light was a wave, or at least it certainly seemed like a wave. Um, but they had also begun to connect the concept of energy to waves. And I want to do that a little bit right here. So here is here's kind of another way to look at it picture up here. We take light in and the prism breaks it up and red light turns out, I know I'm drawing this in blue, but red light has a very long wavelength. That's way it's really stretched out. And orange light is almost as stretched out, but not quite. And yellow light is not even as stretched out. And green light is less, even less stretched out and blue light even less yet stretched out, and violet light is not hardly stretched at all. Sorry about that, it's not a very good wave. But the point is, is that the different colors of light waves actually are have longer and shorter wavelengths. And it turns out in a continuous spectrum, there's all kinds of waves in between here. I, I can't draw them. So essentially, in a continuous spectrum, like you see in a rainbow, there's an infinite number of waves in here of all different wavelengths. And what we want to do here is connect the concept of waves and wavelength. I'll write that word down, wave length. Okay. So here's long. And here's short. We want to connect that to the concept of energy. So Let's imagine instead of a light wave, let's pretend we're making a wave on a slinky. Perhaps you've played with a slinky before. So you shake your hand like this, back and forth, or maybe up and down, and you make waves on the slinky. 
I want you to imagine is that if you shake your hand very slowly, then the waves you make are very long. And if you shake your hand back and forth very quickly, those waves are super short. I tried to find a YouTube video to show you, but I couldn't, but perhaps you can find one. Or if not, perhaps you just can imagine what I'm talking about. Anyway, here's my point. Fast shaking makes short waves. Slow shaking makes long waves. Now we know from our studies last term that fast means lots of energy. And so what we can see then from here is that lots of energy means short waves. And slow, we know from last term, is little energy. And what I tried to show you here with the slinky analogy is slow means long waves. So let's do a little quiz. Red light, would red light carry lots of energy or not much energy? If you said not much energy, you're correct because red light is long waves, long waves is little energy. So there's a connection between energy and wavelength. And that's the important thing uh, for us to know about uh, energy and light waves. All right, and that sums things up. Uh, if your teacher has given you the assignment to make a, a one-page summary of this video, then that's exactly what you should do now. Hopefully you have learned the important background information that we need you to have. Thank you.